are you doing? It just feels like we've been waiting our whole lives for this. I know. <laughs> I know. You're such a kindred spirit. Thank you so much for doing this, Neve. My pleasure. Truly, you have been very influential in the formation of this podcast for me because I have been following your work, feels like from the beginning of the public view. Yeah. Would you tell us the long version of your journey? Sure. Well, I'm happy to take listeners on a brief but detailed journey into the life-changing events that led me on the catfish path. So I grew up in New York City, very fortunate to have wonderful parents, both my mother and my father and my stepmother father who came into my life at a pretty young age and even more fortunate to live on the Upper West Side near Lincoln Center and have parents who were passionate about the arts and always taking me to see dance and music and all kinds of strange things. In fact, one of the earliest theatrical memories I have, you know, after seeing The Nutcracker as a kid was my parents took me to see a show way downtown off Broadway called Puppetry of the Penis which was, if I remember correctly, two Australian men who were totally naked on the stage making strange and unusual shapes with their genitalia for an hour. Oh, my God. It was great. So I grew up around the arts, and I was very fortunate to dance with Jacques D'Amboise, who started an incredible organization called the National Dance Institute, which is still a hugely important organization that gets underprivileged, underserved inner city kids access to dance classes and then performances and just an amazing group. So I did that in middle school, and then through high school and college, I took a little bit of dance here and there. And you went to college in New York? Yeah, I went to a art school called Sarah Lawrence. But school was never my thing, and I knew that from a very young age. I just didn't do well in the academic environment. I was much more of a hands-on, sort of physical, creative person. And so when my brother, who was always interested in filmmaking and is currently a director, was asked to make a bar mitzvah video for some family friends... He sort of very respectfully declined, but said to me, hey, Neve, you know, you kind of know how to make movies. And my roommate at the time was a film student. So I said, yeah, sure, I can do it. So we ended up making this video and it was great. So all of a sudden, that uptown Jewish mom recommended me to her friends who were also looking for videographers for their sons and daughters, bar and bat mitzvahs. And before I knew it, I was booked making bar mitzvah montages and wedding videos and anniversary videos for people. I mean, it was like I became the go-to guy for any event videography needs in New York City. And the best part of it was that my brother, who was at NYU film school, had all of his friends who were so talented, had all the equipment, and were desperately looking to make some cash. So I got to hire all these guys who are now famous filmmakers to make these ridiculous bar mitzvah montages. So that's what got me into sort of film production. And I still love dance, though. So I ended up using my equipment and my time and my resources to photograph and film dance. Long story short... We ended up making my brother, our friend Henry, myself, and a bunch of friends I had made at New York City Ballet, ended up making this incredible 35 millimeter film for PBS of a Jerome Robbins ballet. Jerome Robbins is the same guy who choreographed West Side Story and directed many other fantastic shows and films. And this was sort of like a rough sketch he had done, very much in line with West Side Story, but it was unscripted. It was just sort of an abstract, urban, youthful, angsty, sexual, five act, dance that we shot out all over New York City. And that film got a lot of press. And because I had taken the photos on set, my photos got used for the articles. And it just so happened that a woman in Michigan saw my photos. And so did her daughter. And she reached out and her daughter sent me a message and said, Hey, I saw your pictures of dancers. I love ballet. I also love to paint. Would you mind if I painted one of your photos? Now, mind you, this was 2007, so it was actually a message on MySpace, which was still, you know, sort of a thing back then. And I thought it was charming. I said, absolutely, I'd love to have you paint it. So lo and behold, a week later, I get a, an envelope in the mail at my office with a little watercolor painting of my photo, and it was really good. And so I write back, and I start this fun correspondence with this young girl who's eight, Abby, and her mother, who's sort of supervising the exchange and chiming in from time to time. But so grateful that I've communicated and responded and that I'm being so supportive of this young girl and her passion for art and her discovery of her talents. 
Anyway, the correspondent goes back and forth for a few weeks. And this was also at the same time that Facebook sort of was becoming popular. So all of a sudden, I start getting friend requests from the mom, her other older daughter, the cousins, the babysitter. And I've become part of this community of people living in the far, far north upper peninsula of Michigan, which is a place I'd never been. Most people haven't and felt incredibly far away and sort of romantic and exciting to me as a city kid. I'd always dreamed of a country house and sort of living on a horse farm and, you know, doing all that. So I was really into it. And they were musical and they would send me songs that they had written. And the correspondence kind of went back and forth. And before I knew it, I was starting to flirt with the older sister who was 19. At the time, I think I was 24 or 25. And we kind of started this flirtation and started talking on the phone and they kept sending paintings and she kept, you know, reaching out to me. And we started organizing maybe times that we would meet. Months and months go on. We try to meet up. I invite them to New York. I'm going to go there. But something always comes up. Either the car broke down or Abby wasn't going to be there because her dad was going to take her on some trip that weekend or something. And Neve, so- what's your <laughs> level of feeling towards the older sister at right, this Megan. Po- Megan. Well, so, like I said, I was in my 20s. I was in New York City. I was definitely dating and having a great time. With the exception of my college girlfriend, who I was no longer with, I hadn't really found anyone serious or really even figured out what I was doing with my life in any kind of meaningful way at that point. I was sort of lost, but in an okay way, in a sort of healthy, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to keep trying new things kind of way. And Megan became this what would you call it? Like a, like a searchlight or a lighthouse. She became this thing that all of a sudden got my attention in a way I never really felt and sparked my imagination. The idea that there could be this life for me far, far away right. from everything I knew with this girl who lives on a horse farm. And one of the dramas that was going for a while was that one of the horses was pregnant and then she was waiting for the horse to give birth. And then one night the horse did give birth and then something else happened because it was winter. So they had this big storm and someone knocked into the telephone pole. Like it was just all this swirling country drama. Right. There was always something happening and it was so wildly different. Right. It's like, this is a path you could maybe take. Right. So it felt like this almost fairy tale escape for me that I got to be a part of this life and this ecosystem that existed far beyond, even to some extent, the sort of reaches of technology. It really felt like every day I would open my computer or I would log into my email or whatever it was, and there was this soap opera that I got to tune into and be a part of that was sort of happening, it felt like, just for me. And I obviously learned later on that it sort of was just for me. Um, But there were 14 different people who I was friends with on Facebook who were all communicating with each other and posting on each other's walls. And I would get texts or emails from them separately. Oh, last night, Megan came over and we recorded this song. What do you think? That was Alex. And I'd say, oh, cool. I love it. You know, like, what else are you guys working on? And and then there was Ryan, who was the friend who always had a crush on Megan, but Megan never really liked him. Wow. And he didn't really like me because I was like the city slicker who stole her heart. Oh, my God. And so there was this weird, like, beef between us. And he would randomly send me messages like, you know, Megan was really upset. You didn't call her last night. You better not break her heart. And I was like, I didn't know I was supposed to call. Like, every day there was something happening. I didn't know how to deal with it, but it was fascinating. And the paintings just kept coming. Once a week or maybe every two weeks, we'd get a big box, big, with like seven or eight paintings. And they got bigger and bigger. And then they were oil paintings. And then Abby started selling her artwork locally. And so they sent me money because they wanted to share the like earnings with me because I had inspired her and the paintings were of my photos. And I said, no, please, I don't need that. But they insisted. And so I was like, wow, what an amazing, crazy thing that I'm involved with. This is so fun. Not to mention, and this still is a little kind of, I'm embarrassed to say it, but, you know, Megan was a virgin, right? There was this weird virginal sort of aura about her that she really wanted me to be the first person she slept with. Uh, So that was kind of like this strangely enticing cherry on top. And I knew how careful I'd had to be with her because, you know, I grew up in New York City and I was definitely not a virgin and... I didn't necessarily want to take her virginity and not be in a relationship with her. But the fact that there was this opportunity to like have this sort of pure, very country, organic life and relationship with this girl was like very exciting to me. Anyway, 
as I mentioned, my brother and his best friend, Henry, are also filmmakers, and we all shared an office. So they saw me on the phone and writing these emails and getting these big paintings. And as a side project, while they were busy making other things, you know, this was early on in the days of like little SD card digital cameras. We had them and we had hard drives and they would just film me on the phone or writing an email or reading an email or opening a box. And then they would just put it on a hard drive. And there was never a plan or a concept of what they would do with it, but it was this sort of fun thing that was happening that everyone was kind of keeping tabs on. Are they skeptical at this point? What's their reaction? I think they're excited and very curious. There wasn't really that much information at the time. And I don't think they knew everything that was happening because I wasn't sharing everything with them. I think they were just very interested. But it wasn't until three of us were actually in Colorado filming a dance festival in Vail. And I'll never forget that night. I was talking to her on Gchat. Remember when people used to Gchat? Yeah. And I was about to go out to dinner and Megan messaged me and said, hey, I'm with Alex and the gang and we're recording some music in the basement, like any requests. And so I said, oh, sure. At the time, I was really into Johnny Cash. And I was like, how about Tennessee Stud? I'd never heard a girl sing that. So she's like, okay, great. So we go to dinner, we come home. And in my email is an email that says, you know, here it is, Tennessee Stud. And I click on it, I listen to it, it's really good. And the three of us listen to it, like, wow, is this too good for her to have just done? So we go on YouTube and we search Tennessee Stud. And we click a couple pages through, and sure enough, on the third or fourth page, we see the first female singer, and we click on it, and it's the same. It's the same recording. So then I think, wait a second. Okay, maybe she thought she could get away with this because she didn't like her version, or who knows. What about this other song that they sent me a few weeks ago that I've been singing nonstop that is so good? Let me just see if that's their song too. So then we searched that song, which was called It's All Downhill From Here, and discovered that it was actually a song that had been used on the show One Tree Hill. At which point I started thinking like, okay, wait a second. Because I had talked to them a lot about that song. Megan had told me about how she had like written it and how it was really emotional for her. And then her mom had talked about it. Like we had really gotten into the weeds on them singing and writing that song. So what are you feeling in your gut, like, right then? Because there is that moment in nearly every episode of your show. Right. So I think what happened to me, and very similar to what we see happen to people on the show, is you've been willfully disbelieving and ignoring red flags and engaging in this fantasy. Now, in my case, 100%, and in many of the cases on the show, people are playing their part. They're choosing to feel and see what they want to feel and see. And then what happens is enough sort of questions or perhaps enough information or realization sort of bubbles up and the scale starts to tip and anger and confusion and embarrassment start to sort of pile up until all of a sudden you realize, well, wait a second. I never thought to question all of this stuff, but now I think I should. And if I do that and I question this, then I have to question all of this. And then it's your head starts spinning because you think, well, if that one thing's not real, then is anything real? And it just becomes very confusing. So after that second song, what happens? Well, so then after that second song, I get mad. Of course, my brother, sort of his interest gets piqued even more and he wants to start filming what's happening. And I'm not super excited about his sort of fun project of my weird documentary that he's been making. And I start getting mad and I start messaging Megan and essentially confronting her and saying, you know, what the F? You've been lying to me. I don't understand. And she's defending herself and she's getting upset. And then I'm getting messages from her friends and family saying, why are you being so mean? Why are you hurting her? Like, I don't understand. And so I kind of remember just thinking like, okay, let me just stop talking to her and I'm going to start doing some more research. Then I started doing more research because he had also sent me links to real estate listing for a fixer upper horse farm that she had said she bought. This is where the horse was that gave birth. And like that I discovered still for sale, not what she had said she had bought it. And there was this also this like little storefront that they had said they'd rented for Abby's art gallery. And I looked that up, you know, I'm like realizing that all these things that I had been told over the last nine months were either totally lies or versions of some alternate reality that wasn't entirely true. So I didn't really know what to think. But in that moment, we decided, okay, let's stop talking to them and let's just go there. We knew where they lived because I had sent them things and I had seen them with pictures with the things I had sent. So I was like, okay, I know that's their address. At the very least, we can just go there, surprise them and find out what's going on. So that's what we did. When we got there, we discovered something very different than what we had thought, or certainly what I had thought I would find. Now, on the whole way there, you know that you're in for something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's hard to remember exactly, but my feeling at that time was, okay, 
in an effort to try and appeal to me and my urban New York City upbringing, they've embellished and lied about the music and she doesn't own the farm. Maybe she wants to and looked at it, but she didn't actually buy it. So I'm thinking, okay, all these people that I've been talking to all kind of played up their lives to try and make themselves seem a little bit more exciting and artistic than perhaps they really are. It never dawned on me that those people I've been talking to might not actually even be people. Because <laughs> I had had so many individual interactions and not just me. My mom had talked to Angela and Abby's mom. My other friend in New York City had had a whole weird separate interaction with Alex, who was the sort of friend. Oh, my God. If you remember, like on Facebook, you can play games with each other. Like their characters were playing game like on their wall. It would say, you know, Megan played Alex at chess and won. Like there was lots of very real seeming interactions. So we get to Michigan and we go to the house and there's a lot of uncertainty on our part. We're in a place we don't belong. I mean, we're three very coastal kids, uh -huh. you know, in a very country, rural place. And we don't know what we're going to find or how we're going to be received. So the night that we drove up from Chicago, it was like an eight or 10 hour drive. We got to the town at two or three in the morning. And the first stop we made, because we were all so jacked up, was we went to the horse farm. We pull up in the middle of the night. I mean, you know, when I tell you it's like the middle of nowhere, pitch black, I mean, nothing. We pull into the driveway of this horse farm and I'm kind of, like I said, I'm kind of jacked up. I'm like, let's do this. Like if she's here, I want to talk to her right now. And there's no lights on, there's no nothing. We pull up to the mailbox and I open it and it's insane, but in the mailbox are the two postcards that I had sent her weeks or months earlier with weird like stamps on them, like address wrong or, you know, like, but they're in there. So I know she never got those. And then I get out of the car and I walk up to the barn and I look inside the window and there's nothing, right? I mean, there's no horses, there's no baby horse for sure. And there's nothing. So that moment, I think, was the first sort of real grounded. <laughs> it's a big moment. It was a big moment where I was like, okay, <laughs> there's some serious bullshit happening. And now I'm determined to figure it out. Like before that, I think I was still hopeful somehow that there was going to be this explanation and that somehow we could figure it out. What did that feel like? I think weirdly in that moment, there are two major shifts that happened. One was the shift from the excitement and amusement and the butterflies of this relationship and the excitement of meeting this girl. That was where I sort of got angry. Then when I realized the barn and the horses and all that wasn't real, then I think I just kind of got excited in a way that I wanted to find out the truth. Like my detective hat went on and I thought, OK, this is a mystery now and I need to figure it out. What is going on? The next morning, we woke up early. I think it was Sunday morning, and they always have like a Sunday morning breakfast. So I thought, okay, perfect. They should all be there. Let's crash Sunday breakfast. So we get to the house, and we're super nervous. We have no idea what's going to happen. Henry, probably most nervous. He's freaked out. He stays in the car to film and also be like ready to do a getaway. I go in. I'm feeling confident and steadfast. My brother walks up to the door with me. I'm mic'd because we had mics again from our film production from my bar mitzvah video days. And he's just holding one of those little handheld cameras kind of at his chest. I knock on the door and there's this crazy moment where a woman answers the door and I sort of recognize her, but I'm not sure how to place her. And I say, hey, Angela, because she's about the right sort of age to be the mother in this house. But it's not the Angela from the picture. And she says yes. And of course, her mind must be racing. And there's this very awkward moment where she gives me this hug and neither of us knows what to say. And she hugs me way too long. But I think she's just desperately trying to think, OK, what am I going to say right now? How do I cover my ass? How do I make something up? How do I figure out what to do right now? And the first thing she then says after we hug is Megan's not here. <sighs> So I'm thinking, okay, where is she? Because I really kind of want to meet Megan, but I also want to meet Abby. And then she's like, oh, and Abby's not here either. She's at her friend's. And then this strange guy comes around the corner and we don't know who he is. And he is being very friendly, but he also looks like he's seen better days. And he's like a little rough around the edges. And he invites us in and we kind of look at each other and think like, okay, we're going to go inside this house and we're never going to come out. He's going to bludgeon us to death. And Henry's in the car? Yeah, Henry's still in the car. This point. <laughs> anyway, long story short, what we ended up discovering over the course of the next few days was that Angela, who really was the mom and that was her name, had started painting and wanted to share her artwork and sort of get some feedback on the internet, but initially did not get very good feedback because for a 40-something-year-old woman to start painting and her artwork to be, you know, essentially pretty basic. I mean, it was someone learning how to paint. 
she wasn't getting the positive reinforcement she had hoped for. So she thought, well, what if I create a page for my daughter who's eight and I say it's her artwork, maybe then people will be supportive. So she created this page. Immediately, people had been very supportive and excited. Oh my God, Abby, this is so great. And she was so motivated by the encouragement that she kind of leaned into it. And at some point, saw the picture I'd taken in the newspaper and decided to reach out as Abby. We then started communicating. She wanted to be able to talk to me more than just as sort of Abby and her mom. So she created the Megan profile and then needed to make it seem more real. One woman created all of these profiles, all while married with an actual eight-year-old daughter named Abby, who didn't know who I was, and a husband. And two severely handicapped twin boys from the husband's first marriage or relationship that she was essentially the 24-hour nurse and caregiver for who were, I think, around 18 or 19 at the time, but completely incapable of caring for themselves. And as her escape from this world, from this life that she had found herself in, she started painting and started creating this alternate universe of people and relationships with me and each other, unbeknownst to her family. They only knew of me as the guy from New York who buys her artwork, which of course was not true. She was sending it to me, spending lots of money to send it to me. And in that moment, when we finally kind of realized it and she confessed to much of it, it became very clear to all of us that the story was no longer about me. And that while my feelings still existed, they essentially paled in comparison to hers and what she was feeling and what she had gone through and what her life experience was. And, you know, there wasn't really a moment that we discussed it or strategized about it. I think we all just knew instinctively that this woman needed to tell her story and needed to be heard. And like so many other people probably had been just desperately looking for some escape from her reality. And I had become that escape. And while it had been confusing and a bit upsetting for me, it was nothing compared to what she's been through. And so we just sort of listened and we let her talk and we, you know, gently coaxed her to be more and more honest with us until we felt as though she'd finally opened up and revealed everything. And we never told the husband and we never sort of blew her cover or scolded her or in any way reprimanded her. We really just helped her. Yeah. It really struck me, as it always does, Neve, how compassionate you are to people who are guilty of uh, deception. Well, I haven't always been so kind, but I'm grateful that many life experiences, many mistakes that I had made, many interactions I'd had that had left people hurt or confused or upset with me had taught me and prepared me for that moment to show compassion. And subsequently, my brother and Henry, who are terrific people and filmmakers, were able to then take all that footage that they had sort of randomly been accumulating, coupled with the experience of going there, and edit it beautifully into a documentary called Catfish, which somehow, through a series of incredibly lucky connections and good luck, ended up at the Sundance Film Festival and ended up becoming this film that got bought and then released in theaters. And all of a sudden, I was introduced to the world via this experience in film as this incredibly compassionate person who had been duped. And people started reaching out with their stories, with their very personal and often embarrassing and confusing stories of deception or current situations feeling as though maybe I could help them because perhaps they were getting tricked too. Wow. How would they reach out to you? They just started messaging me on Facebook. Wow. Yeah. And this was before Facebook pages. I was just me on Facebook and people could just find me and message me. And, and then I very quickly realized, okay, this is a lot. Let me set up an email address. So I just created a catfish neve at Gmail, which I still have, where I still get hundreds of emails a day from people looking for some advice or oftentimes, oh, my sister or my mother's in this relationship. She won't listen to me. I'm sure she's getting catfish, but can you help her? So we said, we got to help. What do we do? And it occurred to us that perhaps there is a way to help these people via a show. And that's the long version of how we ended up making Catfish the Show, which we're now 10 years and 200 plus episodes into making. Neve, how have your instincts sharpened? And also sort of on a broad level, what trends have you noticed? And how would you define Catfish? So I'll go backwards, I think. In the documentary, we're talking to Vince, who is Angela's husband. I don't know if they're still married, but I hope they are. And keep in mind, he does not know that she's been lying to me and created all these people and has been essentially flirting with me and in love with me for the past nine months. He just thinks I'm this guy who's been supporting her artwork. But he knows that she's very creative, obviously, and imaginative. 
And he's describing her and talking about how she's just this amazing person. She decided she wanted to start painting. And so she set up the attic as her studio. And she's just been making these artworks. You know, she's such a great cook. She doesn't just make a plate of food. She makes a meal. And he's really expounding on how wonderful she is. And then he goes on to say that Angela is so fantastic even though she can be a little unpredictable. And he refers to this story that I think he had heard in a Bible study group about how fishermen back in the, I think, 18th or 19th century would take these large fishing boats across the Pacific Ocean, generally from Alaska, I guess, to China. And along the way, they would fish for cod. But because the trip took so many weeks, they wouldn't kill the fish. And at the time, they didn't have the technology to make ice. So in the bottom of the ships, they had vats of water and what they discovered was that over the course of the journey, the codfish, because they were no longer in their natural environment, because there was no stimulation, they would stop swimming as much and moving as much and their muscles would break down and soften and that would decrease their flavor and sort of viability as sellable fish meat. So somebody had the bright idea to put some catfish in the vats with the cod, because I guess catfish is a predator of cod and they would chase them. And though you might lose a few along the way, sure. you'd keep all of the rest of them moving and fresh and tasty. And in life, and this was his analogy, in life, there are people who are catfish, who keep us moving and keep us guessing and keep us on our toes. And he then went on to say he thanks God for the catfish because without them, life would be boring and dull. And without even realizing how profoundly accurate he was, he gave us the title for our film, Catfish. And so when we named it Catfish, we always thought of it as this beautiful analogy for people who push the envelope, people who challenge authority, people who are always thinking outside the box and maybe breaking rules, but also making life interesting. And that's how we think of Angela. I still think of all of the people who are catfish on the show. It kind of got distilled and ended up becoming a word just to refer to someone who makes a fake profile on the internet and often, I think, unfortunately gets aligned with just liar. But that was never what we thought of it. And that's still not what I think of it now when I make the show and I meet these people because I do think they're all interesting and they all have stories to tell and they all have dynamic, diverse backstories and come from places and worlds I don't know. And I'm just fascinated by all of it. And getting to meet them and make the show continues to fill my life with new information and make it interesting and fun. So that's sort of the explanation for Catfish. And Neve, to compliment you, you always see outside of the act of cruelty of what could be perceived at least as an act of cruelty, leading somebody on, getting somebody to fall in love with you. You always get to sort of a base idea of loneliness. Yeah. But to answer the question about that, I think one of the similarities that I've found, and there's a few over the course of the last 10 years, meeting all these people, is firstly that with very, very few exceptions, I think there are no evil people or bad people. There are just people who have had evil things done to them. And I was so fortunate that having grown up in a family with incredibly supportive, present, caring parents, first and foremost, and teachers and friends, that even though I made mistakes and even though I hurt people, I was always forgiven and I was always listened to and I was always encouraged to express myself and always given second and third and fourth chances. But many, many people don't have that. And so when you grow up and your parents don't seem to care or they're not interested and your teachers don't have time or resources to pay attention to you and you're struggling with your academics or your self-esteem or your sexuality or any number of things, and you feel like there's nowhere to go and no one cares and there's no one to listen to you, unfortunately, you have to make self-preservational decisions for yourself without the guidance and help of friends and family. And the internet, weirdly, provides this exploratory space for people who feel isolated and alone to try things out to be someone else, to feel something other than what they feel every day, which is generally bad, to create a life and a world for themselves that they can escape into and get a little bit closer to a feeling they think and hope is happiness or even just attractiveness or a flirtation or recognition or anything than what they're getting in their everyday lives, which is so sad and unfortunate. But that's for many young people and old, but certainly young teenagers, like the reality of their world. 
And so when I meet these people, I immediately want to help them. I know that they've screwed up, but so have I, and so has everyone. But what's so obvious, much like it was with Angela, is that they're just so desperately in need of someone to just ask them how they're feeling and actually take the time to wait and let them think about the answer and then answer it without waiting to sort of say what they want to say, you know, just giving you the floor and waiting. And I think a lot of people who make documentaries or do, do interviews, and I'm sure you probably experienced too, like the most powerful tool you can learn when interviewing someone is the ability to sit through awkward silence because we're conditioned as humans to always try to fill in dead space and never have awkward moments. And when they do happen, we always laugh and say, oh, weird, ha ha. But like, if you don't do that and you actually let those moments extend to the point where someone then realizes, oh my God, if I don't say something, they are never going to, and they're just going to keep listening to me and wait for me. There's this thing that happens, and sometimes it takes 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 seconds. And if you have to sit through it, it's awkward and it's uncomfortable. But then all of a sudden, like there's a brain chemistry thing that goes, oh my God, wait, this person's just waiting for me to actually tell them something. I better say something. And it better be a real thing because they're waiting. But so few people get the opportunity to feel that because generally life moves quick and everyone's saying what they want to say and no one's sitting around waiting for you to talk. And so that's probably the most valuable thing I've learned making the show is just the power of listening without any expectation or need to say anything yourself. Just being there to listen to someone. That's the thing. Yeah. Do you tend to know pretty immediately when you meet the people who the potential catfish could be in their lives? So, no, I never know. You know, usually you'll get a gut feeling at some point just based on the way episodes have trended over the years. If a friend writes in or if there's some sort of friend involved, oftentimes I'll think like, oh, it must be the friend. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Do you think the technology or social media has had a more positive or negative effect on relationships in general? The transition socially that's happened culturally as a result of social media in the last 10 or 15 years has obviously changed a lot. And it's strange because at the end of every episode, for the most part, the hopeful who at this point is often you know, heartbroken that this relationship has fallen apart and that they're no longer in this beautiful correspondence says something along the lines of, well, I learned my lesson. No more online dating for me. I'll never meet anyone on the internet again. And that always feels like a very easy and I think incorrect takeaway from the experience because the internet's amazing and meeting people online is fantastic. And I'm so happy that so many people have done it and have branched out beyond their communities and their worlds to meet and interact with and fall in love with people around the world who they would never have otherwise had an opportunity to do that with. But there is still, and this is what's so fascinating on a sort of anthropological level, you really aren't supposed to know more people than you can see. Our communities are meant to be small and we're meant to interact every day in a very real physical way. And when you start to introduce the opportunity to interact digitally with hundreds of thousands of people in worlds that we've never experienced or can never sort of fully understand, inevitably it creates these equations that don't have you know, logical answers. Like there are too many variables. And sometimes it's great, it works out, and it's a positive, and a lot of times it's a negative, because we're just not designed to exist so far beyond our physical space. But it's also super interesting and fun, and you know we can't go back. It's really kind of changed our notion of intimacy, because you and Cami, your co-host, regularly have people on the show who have been in, you know, a six to 10 month relationship or longer, and they've only texted. Yeah. And they view this as something that is intimate. Absolutely. I and mean, that's what the show has strangely proven, which is that even if we go backwards in time to a period before technology, to some extent, I mean, texting and DMing is essentially love letters, right? I mean, it's written text, which they were doing hundreds of years ago with wax seals and perfume sprays and lipstick kit. You know, like, that's not a new phenomenon that one can become very passionately connected and in love with someone despite not physically being together. But the difference is they have the capacity to. Right. Yes. Well, so but that's what's so interesting. So what the show continues to prove as this sort of strange, unintentional theory is that human beings, almost above everything else, want to connect and feel loved. 
and are willing, despite numerous technological advances and even in many cases, physical proximity and against all explanations of logic, are willing to forego and ignore red flags and put blinders on if they feel like they have even the smallest chance at true love. And that's what's so amazing is that there's this thing, there's this need, there's this incredible desire to be seen and loved and texted and thought of that human beings who are not dumb. I mean, people come on the show, they're perfectly bright, myself included. I got catfished. I'm a college educated city kid. Like, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. If you are getting love from somewhere and you don't think you can get that love anywhere else, you'll do the wildest things to pursue it. That's what keeps the show on. I mean, everyone always asks me, like, how are people still getting catfished in 2022? And I tell them, people want to be loved. It's so hard to find that love, unfortunately, that if someone finds it, even though it might be buried under a mountain of ridiculous nonsense, they're going to pursue it. And to your point about people needing to be heard, even if they don't fully realize it, it's such a compliment to you and to Cammy and to Max that people will reveal themselves at high risk, you know, like oftentimes the catfish er will present themselves on your show and it doesn't seem difficult. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I'm still amazed that people want to come on the show, you know, and they always have the option not to, obviously. We made a real point early on that morally for the show to work, we didn't think it would be fair to just show up and surprise people the way that sort of we had in the doc. So there's always this scene where we call or reach out to the catfish and tell them we'd like to meet up with them and see if they're interested. And sometimes they're less interested and I have to kind of convince them, but there's always the choice for them not to come on. But inevitably, I think 100% of the time, with the exception of a few people who just FaceTimed with us, have said yes and have met up with us. And I think the reason for that is because whether they know it or not, realize this is the best opportunity to both come clean in an environment that will be moderated and hopefully objective and compassionate. But like I said before, be heard and actually have someone listen to them and ask them questions and care what they have to say. You've answered a lot of questions for a lot of people. It feels like this hugely important void that we had. I feel more passionately about your show, but a similar comparison could be Teen Mom. Sure. Sort of the service that that does, mm -hmm. not glamorizing what is a hard circumstance. For sure. Hey, Samantha. Hi, Anna. How are you? Oh, great. Thank you for your letter. And Neve is awesome. He is like an expert at this stuff. <laughs> so, Samantha, will you tell us what's going on? So Lisa and I known each other since 2012. I met her through Instagram and I actually talked with her in person when she was go-go dancing back in the days. And then Chad, this is the douchebag, okay? So Chad, I met in 2015 while I was actually downtown Vancouver training with Lisa. So Lisa was my trainer and also a really good friend of mine. I know her backstory. She was in a lot of abusive relationships. And then Chad and I kind of bumped each other down in Vancouver. And we actually were kind of friends-ish. And then I think 2015, 2016, I kind of was like seeing him. And I think we were just like friends with benefit. So you had this undefined relationship with Chad. Yes. But here's the thing, though, because we were seeing each other. We liked each other. In 2016, I did message him saying like, hey, I don't mean to like put you on a spot. I just want to tell you how I feel. And I told him I started to have feelings for him, blah, blah, blah. Never got a text back. So this guy was using me for sex. Okay, done. And then sometime in 2018. So this is the issue. So basically, I lost touch with Lisa due to a miscommunication because I actually brought up one of her ex who actually almost made her deaf in one ear. And she got upset. We haven't talked for like two years. And since the pandemic, I kind of follow her back, start talking to her and be like, hey, how's it going? How are you? And then she was like, where have you been? Like, I've been thinking about you. And I think about her too, as well. Like, she's been that friend of mine for a while. She knows all my issues. She actually was there for me when I lost my dad back in 2018. Ever since the pandemic, I've just been trying to mend our relationship. And then fast forward, 
2021. This is when I find out that Lisa and Chad are dating. And I wanted to tell her that Chad is not what you think he is. Well, wait a second. Did Lisa know when you and Chad were dating? She knew about Chad. Like, I actually talked to her about Chad before. I told her everything about Chad. But she couldn't put the two to two together that that was the same Chad that we know. And she's dating. The problem is this. They may be right for each other. You know? Yeah. And, you know, you haven't been in incredibly close contact with her. It sounds like you really miss her friendship. I do. Yeah. And it's a little hard to gauge how much she misses yours. You said, which is encouraging, that she said, where have you been? I don't know, like, the fallout with whatever happened during that incident where you brought up her ex or whatever. I don't know how devastating that was or if it wasn't at all it was very devastating her ex before she saw chad so basically what happened was that this guy actually was abusive he threatened her so many times and i got in the middle of their relationship because i wanted to save her ass and in order to save her ass we had to do a threesome so oh. it is fucked up and that threesome is what made things weird no, it wasn't weird. I did it to protect her. I did that to save her ass. And the fact that when she told me later on that her ex, they weren't together at the time, they actually moved on. But the fact that like she never called me, she never texted me because her ex actually beat her up to the point where like she's almost deaf in her left ear. I was crush. So hold on, I have some questions. So do you mind, how old are you? I just turned 32. Okay. And is Chad around the same age? He's... One and a half years older than I am, and she's three years older than I am. Okay, and when you were dating Chad, you said around 2015, 16, right? Yeah, so I was 25, 26. Right, okay. So my first thought, and in no way coming to Chad's defense, <laughs> but to speak perhaps as a 37-year-old man who is still very actively working on becoming a reliable, communicative partner. In my 20s, I was a disaster. So while I don't approve of the way that Chad treated you, and I think it was cowardly of him to ghost you when you revealed your feelings, unless you tell me he was awful and mistreated you, it sounds like he was just sort of not looking for a commitment at the time. Yeah. And he wasn't necessarily the worst guy. And if he was just using you for sex, that's also not the worst thing in the world. And sure, your feelings were hurt, but you moved on and you were okay. So Hopefully, Chad has evolved and matured since then. And so I don't think you should necessarily assume he's the same person he was seven or eight years ago. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's just that when I was still his Facebook friend and also was following him on Instagram, his dating life was really horrible. He's like that typical, like, he's a good looking guy. But like, I get that he was not wanting to like commit. That's understandable. The thing is, it's just that like he was bouncing from one girl to the next. Guys, I think that we're off track with Chad. Sure. I think that he's not going to suddenly be pursuing you, right? And you guys maybe didn't work. And maybe Lisa and Chad work for whatever reason. At least he's not physically abusive. And maybe they have a nice relationship that we should be celebrating. I feel like this is really about Samantha's mourning Lisa's friendship. There was this big event that happened that was really intimate. And I want to know how you guys recovered from that, like you and Lisa. Because we can't control Chad's behavior, you know what I mean? Yeah. He's sort of the past now. I think the goal here is to have a friendship with Lisa. Yeah. That has to be our goal because it's the one thing we can control. That's what I wanted to do. It's like, I actually want to be a part of her life. How did you guys communicate after the threesome? We still texted and we still talk about it. Like how? Basically, she felt appreciative. That just made us a lot tighter because she knew that I would do anything to save her ass. Whether that was like an abusive boyfriend or not, she knew I was one of those people. So what broke up the friendship, essentially? Because I saw her ex on a dating app, I kind of was like, hey, guess who I found? Like on Tinder or Bumble. Oh. Oh. And that was when she got triggered. And I meant it as like a joke. I should have been a little bit more sensitive. It sounds like you really love her and you want her in your life intensely. Yeah. I bet you're like me. Like I have a best friend that, especially when I was younger, if there was a fight between us, it was just as devastating as like a boyfriend fight, if not more so. 
So we truly can't do anything about Chad. Yeah. Can I ask you, have you had other intimate interactions with women? No. And it was just the one time with Lisa. It was that one time and I did that for her. But do I have any romantic relationship with her that I care about her? No. She's like a sister that I never had. She was the one that actually cared for me when I needed help. And especially when I was going through so much with my dad. Yeah. If you feel like your pain with Chad outweighs your missing the friendship with Lisa, then that's kind of a different story. But my instinct is that you miss Lisa. Let me ask you this. What was the nature of your very last dialogue with Lisa? It was actually when she was in Mexico. I was like, hope she was safe because there was nothing of shooting in Mexico because I was worried for her safety. Okay, but you were also kind of wanted to reach out because you knew she was there with chat. A little bit. It's okay. You're human. I'm human. No, no, there was. But it was just basically, I just wanted to hint her like, hey, I know Chad, just an FYI. But did you clearly communicate to her that the guy she's dating is the same guy you had dated? Does she now know that? No. So she still doesn't know. You don't think Chad would have brought it up? I don't know. That's the thing. Because Chad actually unfriended me on Facebook and I blocked him on all social media. And then I just walked away from the relationship because I was getting a little too emotional because it hurt me. I think you need to tell her how much you love her and you miss her and you want to be close with her again. I think you need to admit to some degree of needing her more than she needs you. Like you can say, I'm the kind of person who really treasures my friendships and I've missed you and I know that I can be demanding and I'm sorry. And I also really want to apologize for showing you that Russ was on that dating app. I don't know what I needed out of that moment. I can justify it by saying that I thought it was going to be funny. And I'm really sorry. And I love you so much. And I miss you. And I hope we can get together. It's so easy to be generous with apologies. It is so easy. We think of it as so hard, like we're losing something. But we're just gaining. It is just playing the long game. It's really easy to open those doors. And you would be surprised with what you get back. Yeah. I'll add one last thing just to wrap it up. Since I heard what you were saying about apologies, Anna, I feel like you have to always also be careful because sometimes apologies can be very selfish. Yes. Because you want to say you're sorry to make you feel better. So just make sure if and how and when you do feel if there's a reason to apologize to Lisa that you make sure it's not so that you feel better. It's so that she feels seen and understood. Yeah. And I mean, Chad is lame, but you can't have a role in that relationship. Yeah. They won't let you. Yeah. I respect it out of them. Like, you know, they're seeing each other. It's like, it's not meant to be. At the end of the day, it was like, I mourn for the loss of my friendship with Lisa. Yeah. Which I really want to mend. And basically, I really want to tell her, like, I want to be there for her no matter what. And then the other thing that I want to tell you to do is to make a point of socializing. I think we're all really used to being at home. Force yourself, even if you don't want to, to go out once a week to nurture friendships that you haven't. Maybe some family. I mean, I know that's a whole other journey. But listen, it's going to be okay. Yeah. You are amazing. Thank you. Worthy of love. And I love you. I do. Thank you, Anna. And you got this. Thank you, Anna. It starts with you. Yeah. You'll get it all back in different ways. Thank you. Samantha, thank you so much. Good luck. Neve, how old were you when you first felt like you were in love? I think I was 19 and I was a sophomore at college. And there was a girl who came to my school as a freshman. And I'd just never seen someone so beautiful and I'd never been so attracted to anyone. And I just sort of zeroed in on her and amazingly convinced her to go out with me. And she became my first girlfriend. And that was the first time I think I felt like I was in love. Did you futurize a lot with her? Do you have that kind of practicality? No, in fact, I think I'm still pretty bad at futurizing, which is a cool word I've never heard. I didn't even know there was a word for that. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I'm a very impulsive, in-the-moment kind of guy. My mom always joked that I exist on Neve time, which is its own sort of plane. How practically does that manifest? Okay, I'll give you a great example. Okay. Because it just happened. 
I love old cars, classic cars. I've had a bunch and they're never fancy or expensive. They're just fun. And I love the community of restoring cars and the journey of meeting people and finding parts and all that. Anyway, because I can, and I have the means to own more than one car now than I did for many years, I don't have a collection of cars, but it's bordering on collection of cars. So a couple of weeks ago, I get a call from MTV. They're shooting their new season of MTV Cribs. And they want to know if I'd be interested in having my crib featured. So, of course, you know, I grew up with that show. I'm sure you remember. Yeah. So I said, absolutely. That would be so fun. And there's a fee. You know, they have a nice little fee that they give. Sure. They're coming into your home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, OK, super fun. I got this sort of extra money that I hadn't planned on. That's kind of a bonus. And I love my house. and It's super cute and charming. But like, what can I do with that money to make this episode of Cribs extra special? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and last year, or 2020 even, I think, we were out in LA and we needed to get a new car because our lease was up and I wanted to get a minivan. But because of the whole microchip problem and the supply chain, minivans were unavailable. And at that time, my wife had jokingly said, why don't we just get a limo instead? Which I thought was a great idea. Amazing. So she had planted the seed in my head to <laughs> sort of gently look for a limousine to buy. But she had totally forgotten. Now, all of a sudden, I'm thinking, okay, got this cash. How fun to have a limousine on the show for the Cribs episode. So I start researching feverishly. So I've only got like two weeks to find and buy this car. And I very quickly realized I don't want it to be a newer limo because those are boring. So then I realized, oh, of course I know what it should be. It should be a Cadillac limousine like the one that <laughs> Jim Carrey drives in the <laughs> opening scene of Dumb and Dumber, right? Because that's my favorite movie of all time. And... That scene where he stops at the bus stop, jumps in the back, <laughs> rolls down the window for that beautiful woman and <laughs> pretends that it's his car. Like, what a great scene, right? So I go on a search for what I now know is a Cadillac Brom de la Gans limousine. And what I learn is limousines, they were never manufactured by the car company. So Cadillac never made a limousine. They made a car and then different limousine coach builders would then cut those stock cars and actually extend them. And so no two limousines are the same because they were always custom ordered, right? So everyone is different. It's fascinating. Anyway, I also discovered that they're wildly affordable because nobody wants an old limousine, right? <laughs> so I find a guy selling a 1989 Cadillac limousine in Las Vegas. It had been custom built for the owner of the Circus Circus Casino. It was his personal car just to go to and from work. Never used commercially, never mistreated, only has 24,000 miles on it. And it's been owned since that guy's death in 2002 by the guy who owns it now, who's taking care of it and only used it to like drive his wife to the airport for fun. And that's about it once a year, right? So I decide, okay, I have to be in LA for a few days before my family flies out. We're out here for a few weeks of the summer. I'm going to fly to Vegas, buy the car, drive it back, and I'll surprise my wife when she arrives with the kids and I'll pick them up at the airport. And in my insane brain, which does not forecast or futurize very well, I think like she's going to love it. It's going to be so fun. She's going to think it's the greatest thing ever, right? The kids are going to have so much fun. <laughs> So Cammie, because we'd been filming that week and I used the car in the episode, which is going to be great. She had encouraged me like, don't pick Laura and the kids up from the airport after a long, hard day of traveling in this car and like spring it on her because she's not going to be in the mood. It's not going to be the right time. Like, I think that's a bad idea. So wise. So wise, right? Of course, the flight was delayed. The kids are a disaster, but they make it. I pick them up on the regular car. I bring them home. Next day, she sees the car and she's curious. You know, I don't get to like make a big fun thing out of it. She just sort of sees it. And fast forward to her essentially saying to me like, hey, you know, I love this car and it's super fun, but it's weird to me that you snuck off to Vegas and <laughs> did this thing and didn't tell me. And it makes me feel like I don't know what you're doing and I can't trust you. And also like, what were you thinking? <laughs> this is insane. And she's 100% right. And I never thought that far ahead because I just sort of see like what's right in front of me. This might be a vulnerable question, but do you think that that sense of spontaneity has hurt people unintentionally? Oh, 100%. I mean, even just the example of the car and my wife, like she was hurt. At first, I didn't really get it because I thought like, well, but you know now what I was doing. And even though I didn't tell you, and yes, it would have been great to have done this adventure together, 
the timing of it. I needed it for the shoot and you were in it, but it hurt her. And I feel badly that it did. And I'm trying to constantly sort of intake and learn from these moments because even though in my head it was very justified and explainable and I wanted it to be a surprise so I thought like well a I don't want to tell you because I want it to be a surprise and b if I do tell you you'll either be bummed that you're not going with me or you'll discourage me from getting it because it makes no logical sense and I don't want to be discouraged so I'm going to keep it kind of a secret from you but also justify that I put together some very loose logic as to how I could kind of get away with it. And unfortunately, it was not sound enough to pass the test of actual smart wife woman logic. So to sort of delicately get back to the first time you fell in love, how long was this relationship? We dated for sophomore year and she had grown up in Belgium. So she went back for the summer. I think I flew out there and visited her for a few weeks, which was great. And then I took like a year off from school and our relationship became this sort of abstract on and off again thing for what I guess was about two and a half or three years. Who was mostly wanting it to continue? I mean, I was just a total idiot. I was young and not particularly ready for commitment and to be in an exclusive relationship. And so, you know, I had fooled around. And one time I think that she knew of, and she was obviously hurt, but it was like while she was away in the summer. And so it was sort of this gray area. And then we got back together. That was the first time I felt a love for someone where I kept realizing, like, I want to be with this person. I'd never been drawn to someone like that. And I think she shared that. And so despite our conflict and despite my bad decisions and mistreatment of her emotionally, you know, unintentionally, but just because I wasn't good at being in a relationship, having never been in one. So that was hard because I knew I was hurting her and I still regard her as this incredibly pure, beautiful soul. She was too good for me. And the fact that I was lucky enough to get to have her love and affection and attention for as long as I was still blows my mind. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Having just learned an hour ago that you're now in another relationship. My third marriage, yeah. What advice or what have you learned? Because advice is a sort of loosey-goosey term, but what wisdom perhaps can you impart to me as someone who's, you know, whether it's a marriage or a relationship, when you're in love with someone and you're together, it's essentially the same thing with some minor technicalities. But what have you gleaned over the years? Life is short. Like, I'm 45 now. I can see how when an 85-year-old tells you it goes by in a blink, I'm starting to get glimpses of that. My kid is now nine. I oftentimes ask guests about the idea of home and what that feeling is. Like, where do you feel most home? Which, to me, I guess, is a sense of, like, some kind of profound rightness. And so when I talk about the idea of life being short, I just, I want to be able to laugh more, you know, like enjoying the moments. Yes. And I guess it feels like I finally have that. Hi, Jonathan. Hello. How are you? How are y'all? Thank you for your letter. Will you tell us what's going on? Sure. Basically, I've been with my boyfriend, James, for three months, and I have known him for two years, though. So I know him pretty well, or I feel like I do. Um, I guess that's the question we're answering here. And at the time that I met him, we were both in like really messy relationships. So there was a part of it that was natural growth, like things just needed to get good with me. I was in a toxic relationship where I was engaged and I was not in love with that person like at all. I don't know what was going on with me, but I needed something that I wasn't getting. And so I ended up in that thing. And then James was in a relationship that was also toxic, but they had set up all the dominoes to move in with each other. And that was like a big step for everybody involved, people moving out of their mom's houses. He's a little bit younger than me. I'm 36 and he's just turning 30 now. And I've lived away from my parents since I was 17. So I can understand it, <laughs> okay. but it's a different person. <laughs> okay. All right. We're getting somewhere now. <laughs> yeah. So they went through with that though. They all moved in together then with their friends from out of state. So it was complicated and messy. And that took them a long time to uncouple because they'd kind of, you know, double down on the coupling. So eventually that relationship fell apart too. 
And fast forward to last fall when we were both in a better headspace and we'd been hooking up and seeing each other and sort of dating the entire time. Simultaneously, I was dating other people and everything. I just date a lot and I'm kind of poly and I don't know. I like to have fun and I enjoy the company of sexy, funny men. So I was okay, you know, and Then we started to kind of couple and around the new year, we were having real relationship conversations and we eventually in March got together and it was like the weirdest thing because like the entire time I kind of had been like, I can't date James because he's a nice guy and I just don't do that. You know, if it's toxic, I'm just like over there in a heartbeat and trying to help them out. And I was trying to grow away from that. Eventually, that night that we decided to like be together, he was describing our relationship and he was going through like a timeline of it. And it was super sweet, like just the way he was saying it. But very naturally, I know I'd never been in love before this because I felt something I just had never felt before. And I just looked at him and I realized that I loved him. It was not a decision. It was just like, I love you. He's a really, really good man. And that's why it's really hard right now because he doesn't text me back. That's that's the problem. He does not feel the need to communicate with me. And this has happened during a myriad of situations, stress situations where I just wanted to talk to my boyfriend, situations where his mom was in the hospital. He didn't tell me anything about that. And part of it is that there's this whole thing with the SIM card that he got wet one time while doing laundry. Sounds like bullshit to me, but he says that it's damaged. And so it only works sometimes. Miraculously, sometimes it works at my own apartment when he's with me. Oh, Jonathan, (laughs) my first marriage was like this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've heard enough about that marriage where I'm like, that guy should have been kissing your feet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Where it was like, I haven't talked to my husband in four days. I wonder what's going on. Like, it was like we were play acting a relationship. Yeah. I feel what you're saying. So you want to be in a relationship. Yes. You have a boyfriend in title. (laughs) Yes. When he's with me, though, too. When he's with me perfection communication perfection too how often do you see each other it's usually every two weeks okay but also then if somebody slips up we're in a time right now where it's going to be a month and he doesn't think it's a big deal at all (laughs) do you guys live in the same city 30 minutes with or without traffic there's no excuse (laughs) but he doesn't drive but that actually hasn't been a problem because i am all over kind of during the day so That has actually never been a resentment thing that I have to go pick him up. Yeah, but so wait, why don't you pick him up more? I offer to pick him up. It's like, okay, he works six days a week, six hours only a day. So it makes this thing where it's like, if I'm going to go pick him up and have dinner or whatever, he does say this thing. He's like, if I'm going to see you, I want to see you for like two days. He's 30? Newly 30. Okay. He may be wonderful. I'm sure he is. Yeah. But he is at a different stage in his life, Jonathan. And I'm worried that this is one long heartbreak. Yeah. Yeah. My first thought earlier when you were describing yourself and your tendency to be with people and want to always sort of experience fun and different energies was that I relate to that. And for many years and and still to some extent, you know, I crave new and different attention and affection and flirtation. It's fun. It makes you feel good. It reminds you that you're of some sort of value socially and sexually. And I feel like you still need that. I mean, everyone, I think, does and should forever. But I get the sense that your interest in this guy, though genuine, is still very muddled into the category of like, it's exciting, it's fun, I like him. Yes, he's a little different than maybe the guys I usually go with, but it doesn't feel to me like you're really ready to give all that up. I know what you're saying. And I distrusted my own thought because I've been so entrenched in that life for so long. I have an entire digital series that I made about my dating life as a trans man that literally is just like, everybody look at this. Look what happened. I'm open about it. It's part of my art and it's part of my writing. 
But I really did feel like when I met him, I was not interested because he was so good. And then when I really started to have these conversations with him about like who we were and how we felt about our life experiences, he's got to be fucking Meryl Streep if he is delivering me a performance of this. I don't believe that part of it. That's why I called because I'm like, I don't believe that this guy could do that much acting. You know, it's strange. Well, right. But interestingly, you're somewhat self-fulfilling your own pattern here, which is that you've now detected that despite your initial sort of confusion and interest in someone who seemed to be so good and positive and exactly what you wanted, you've now detected that there is something off and something strange and you're not being treated the way you'd like to be. And it's drawing you in right. and you're, you're leaning into it rather than the sort of red flags going up and saying, oh, well, oh, well, I guess this wasn't what I hoped it was. Yeah. And you're now trying to figure him out and fix this problem. And not to say that you shouldn't, right? because that could yield what you're looking for. But I think it's just an interesting perspective to get if you haven't already on this moment where it started going from what you'd hoped it was, which was this good thing. And it's kind of shifting back into old patterns. I mean, it sounds like you guys both clearly felt an intense connection. Right. And still do. Yeah. I'm just worried that you love him or the idea of him. Yeah. I mean, it definitely feels like I love him more than he loves me. So it's just not good. And I do think part of this is that even in relationships that went on for a really long time with people that said that they were totally cool with being with a trans person, like that doesn't always stick. Like people get weird about it after a while and kind of ask you to have their baby someday or something like that. Things that I really didn't want and made really clear. And so there's a part of this that's like, he's not like that at all. It really feels like he's into my body because it's my body, not a trans body. So I don't know. I think that links up with what you're saying in terms of like thinking about it, like finding a needle in a haystack to find somebody that's sexually compatible with me, which is not a good space for my head to even be at thinking that it's a rare form to be into me, you know? (laughs) So I, I feel what you're saying. I feel like you're waiting for me to be like, I'm going to break up with him right now. (laughs) No, not at all, because I don't want you to. I just want you to understand. Right. I want you to protect yourself a little bit. I totally think you should still enjoy each other. Yeah. You guys make each other happy. Right. When you do see him. Right. Right. (laughs) Can we get him a new SIM card? Could that be the fix? See, and I saw those phone people outside the dollar store and I literally was this close to just pulling over and being like, yeah, I know someone who needs a phone and getting him a phone. But then as I thought about it, I thought this sounds psycho that I'm getting my boyfriend a phone so that he could specifically talk to me. Like, what's heartbreaking is that you had that internal dilemma, (laughs) right? You know, you shouldn't have had to have that. Yeah. (laughs) I think you are wonderful. And I think that you just, need to protect your heart in terms of understanding where he is in his life, which is just having moved out of his parents' home. Yeah. You're like eight miles ahead of him. Neve, do you oftentimes have the sense that the people on your show on a gut level really understand already the answer? That's so funny. I was just going to say to Jonathan, I think you already know. Right. You're already intuitive enough and I think sensitive and in touch with yourself enough to have written in and sort of raised the flag and said, wait a second, there's something going on here that I'm uncomfortable with that's hurting me, that doesn't feel right. And I don't necessarily even think you really called in because you needed advice. I think you just wanted to hear yourself say it, get some fresh perspective, both from your own words and from perhaps us. Yeah. (laughs) But I think you already know, we have no answer for you that you don't already have for yourself. And I think much like Anna said, people who write into my show, there's already a moment in their brain that said something's off. I'm not getting what I need out of this. I don't want to go on a TV show to meet this person, but I feel like if I have to, then there's something wrong. But I'm still so desperate to get there. I'm willing to do whatever I have to. 
And I don't think you're desperate. Right. And you obviously don't need to meet this guy because you're dating him. But whatever your version of meeting this person is or whatever your version of solving this mystery is, has led you down a road that I think you'd rather not be on. Yeah. And not to say that processing things and talking things out and having friendships and conversations is ever a bad idea if a relationship isn't going the way you'd like it to. But it certainly has prompted you to look at this experience you're having in a way that's raised some questions. And so I think you're already a few steps ahead of us and know yourself better than we ever will. So I think you should just trust whatever it is that your brain and heart and gut are telling you whether that means talking to him and saying something to him that might be difficult or taking a break and giving him some space from you to reassess how much he values the time you have together. And there are a lot of options you have, but I think you have a pretty firm grasp on what feels right for you and what doesn't. So as long as you trust that and follow that instinct, I think you'll be fine. You'll figure it out. Yeah, I think there's a point to that, too, because I have been trying to gauge how upset I would be, you know, if we broke up, if we took time apart. There's no, like, thing where, like, I can't go out and, like, have dates. This guy may be the one, but it certainly won't be for 15 years. I think you're right. <laughs> I think you might be right. <laughs> you are way ahead of him. And so just keep expanding your world. The world is full of opportunity. Yeah. Have a blast. Go have fun and enjoy him when you can. Yeah. You know, feel close to him. Life is short. Yeah. Let's live it. I think that's great advice. I'm going to take it. Good. My career is like going up and my social life feels really incongruous with that. So I do want to just have fun, you know? Good. Yes. Yeah. Use this time as like upward trajectory. Well, thanks to you both. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Neve, you're excellent at this. Thank you so much for taking all this time as well. Sure. This was wonderful. I love this. I love talking to people and hearing about their lives and their relationships. Me too. You are a hero. That's how I view it. <laughs> well, I do feel very lucky that my job also feels like a reward that I get to help people. And I'm constantly reminded of that. And I blush very often because people come up to me all the time to say that they really value my show and it offers them a lot of helpful advice or motivation or whatever it might be. So it's a real gift that I get to do what I do and enjoy doing it so much. I just love your show and I've loved talking with you. Thanks again, Neve.